Webster. Our student for today is by Lauren Ernest. She's a senior political science major with a minor in history, and she will be giving her presentation on the First Lady of House of Singer or Political Actor. Madison is my first case study. 
So Dolly Madison, in her present presence at her husband's side, fundamentally changed American politics. Now how can that be? Here's how. She understood the importance of social, stru social structure, normalcy, peace, and leadership. She was able to mend political relationships between her husband and other political members through the use of public gatherings. For example, she wanted to use the ceremonial role of, hey, I'm going to stand by my husband, and I'm going to create these bowls, dinners, everything along those lines, but she wanted to make sure that there would be an avenue for politics at these places. And so she would create atmospheres where light and informal discussion could be displayed. So she intended to use these social functions as a political ideal breeding ground, and that whole idea was started by Dolly Madison. And another thing with Dolly Madison, she has, is seen as a hero in, ter in terms of the siege at Washington during the War of 1812. During the siege, obviously the British were burning down Washington and many things that were going on. So she decided, okay, I'm gonna be the social leader that I need to be right now, but I'm also gonna be the leader that the American people in the future need me to be. She decided and identified several artifacts in the White House that needed to be saved from the fire. And because of this, we still have those artifacts today, which is very important. Which is why, again, history remembers her for that. Another first lady I would like to speak on for the first hostess role is Mary Todd Lincoln. Mary Todd Lincoln, while she does not get talked about a lot in the first lady literature, she had a very interesting and difficult life. However, while she was walking through the White House for the first time as First Lady, she saw that it was in deplorable conditions. Drapes were ripped, the smell of urine was in the air, and there was a rat infestation in the basement. And she did not appreciate that the people's house was in this condition. So what did she do? She wanted to have a restoration. So at this rest restoration, it caused so much commotion in Congress that there was even an investigation in her accounts. However, everything was deemed legal then and is still deemed legal today. But she was, once the restoration occurred, she threw parties, and in these parties, she inv invited actors, writers, editors, soldiers, politicians, and all of the above. Because in the background, we must realize civil war is going on. So it is very important to promote some kind of unity and able to discuss those things at these social gatherings. So as we see, this hostess decided to have a diverse guest list and bring the public in in many different ways. When she would host the ball, she would invite members of the public to come as well so they could feel more attached and more, not necessarily influenced, but interactive with this whole propped up role of the president, first lady, and Congress. We think of them as above us, but they're not. And she wanted to definitely communicate that role to the public. What is interesting enough, just like Dolly Madison, she was able to create an atmosphere where informal discussion of politics could occur. Even so that she would be the leader of the party and be able to conduct herself like that. President Lincoln was able to sneak away and discuss very important legislation such as the 13th, 13th Amendment in an informal way while trying to garner votes in Congress for it, which is very, very important because the 13th Amendment is very important. Alrighty, and the final First Lady for our first hostess that I would like to discuss is Jackie Kennedy. Jackie Kennedy, while many of the things she did while she was First Lady is overshadowed, unfortunately, by her husband's assassination, JFK. So, but I want to talk about what happened before that. Jackie Kennedy disliked being First, being first Lady in the terms of she thought it would change her. She thought that the office role of First Lady she didn't, was too much of like a title. She wanted to bring her individuality to it. She wanted, she wanted to be herself, which is very, very important because she wanted to make known that it could be changed. She, 
just like Mary Todd Lincoln, walked in the White House and identified several issues. And she was like, why is the people's house in deplorable condition? So she did a restoration as well. And they fixed structural issues that were in the White House. Okay. So after the restoration was complete, she was elevated in a new and very influential popularity in American politics, or among the American people. As a final act to show that the institution did not change her, Jackie Kennedy, when was rode in the car right next to JFK when he was shot, she refused to change her clothing, which had blood stains on it, obviously because things happened, and she said, reportedly had said to Lady Bird Johnson, no, I want them to see what they've done to Jack. And because of this, she was able to not necessarily change, but even after her, the president was gone, she was able to show one last stance of First Lady. This is what a First Lady does. She showed strength and elegance and showed a portion of mourning while the United States was in a social chaos. Alrighty, so my second tier that I think changed the role of First Lady is an international spotlight. And just a note, these are actually fashion shots of what they're doing. Um, so I thought that was really cool. Also, I didn't realize this to just now, but he's a, he looks like he's asleep. So <laughs> I felt like I had to point that out. Alrighty, so the first First Lady I'd like to discuss under the international spotlight is Eleanor Roosevelt. If you know me personally, you know that I love Eleanor Roosevelt very, very much. But she was a political actor from the beginning. She wrote about what was going on in Europe on the eve of World War II. And she wrote in this political column every week. Every week she was committed to writing about what was going on. And it didn't matter who disagreed with her, including her husband. She wrote about things that he was publicly disagreed with, which is very interesting because that's creating her own identity and also a first lady's own identity separate from the president, which is very, very important. Eleanor Roosevelt advised her husband, politicians, and the people of the United States on various, various issues. She was even a part of the Universal Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And she was seen giving a news presentation on what this Declaration of Rights means. Eleanor Roosevelt was a champion of human rights to begin with. But being in this international spotlight and giving a presentation was a worldwide stage that many leaders were able to understand, wow, it's not just the president of the United States who has some kind of pull in the, like, being a part of the world police or being on the world stage. Also, the first lady, she doesn't have to sit silent. She has her own political and her own political views and can actually sit through and discuss with diplomats and ambassadors various things that are going on in the world. That is something that was very important to add. All right. And she also, she advocated for what she thought was right with unwavering determination. On all, she, de she demanded that a first lady be involved in politics, even if she disagreed with her husband, and even if her opinions were unpopular. Just really important. All right, the second first lady on this slide is a more recent first lady. While she is a more recent first lady, and there's not as much literature on her, I do think it is important to mention her. And that is Michelle Obama. Now, Michelle Obama is, was and is a devoted mother. She stated vehemently that her biggest and best role will always be mom in chief, which led her to pursue policy measures that were all about, or children and she even went as far as to advocate for girls worldwide. Now, in a, in a literal bold statement, she had a garden that she took care of on the White House lawn. Now, some of you might be thinking, it's a garden at a house, why does that matter? Here's the thing, we have, we're talking about the White House here, so that's a big difference, number one. Number two, she took 
words, I want to do this. I want people to eat healthier. I want kids to know this. She made a physical representation of that on the White House, which is super cool. Adding on to that first hostess ideal, she went in and she put that policy measure, measure into a physical thing, which is very neat. She also launched and launched the Office of First Lady into the international sphere through speeches in front of international audiences about girls' education worldwide. She advocated on multiple international stages, especially in Europe, about why girls should be, girls worldwide need an education. And she was able to continue this program called Let's Girls Learn, which was her own policy measure separate from her husband's role as president. And she did this Let Girls Learn campaign on her own, which again is very important. Alrighty. And my third little tier here for how the Office of First Lady was changed is the support in domestic policy. <clears throat> As you can see here, I have another more recent First Lady, Hillary Clinton, um, and I have again Eleanor Roosevelt, again big fan of hers, and then I actually have two First Ladies in this photo. So, if you can guess the other one, you can get on this one. <laughs> Alrighty, first, Eleanor Roosevelt was in in FDR or in a little bit of a pickle. Now, I learned about this first in Mr. Johnson's class, actually. So, there were these soldiers from World War I called the Bonus Army. And they marched on Washington because why? They needed money, a bonus, from the war, and because it was the Great Depression and they needed the money. So, FDR was like, what do I do? So while FDR was creating a plan, he knew he needed to make some kind of gesture. So what did he do? He looked to his teammate, confidant, and advisor, Eleanor Roosevelt. He said, all right, here's my plan. And she put her own spin on it as well. She came out with coffee and sandwiches. Not only did she come out with things for them to eat and drink, she sat down with the veterans, their wives, their kids, their mothers, their families, and she listened. She put herself on the same level as the people. She listened to what they needed. Then she went back to the White House and discussed with FDR how to help those soldiers and their families. That shows how regal and capable a first lady can be used in, the, in an administration when an administration is in a crisis. She was helped her husband in a pub. She helped her husband avoid a public fiasco by supporting him and also supporting the veterans by just being herself. So, second one I would like to mention in this is Lady Bird Johnson. I realized that she I could go by her full name. However, not only in the First Lady literature, but also in her own literature, she is referred to as Lady Bird Johnson. So I will follow suit and do the same. Alrighty, so Lady Bird Johnson and President Johnson received or inherited a pretty hostile um, political climate. They um, obviously because JFK had just been assassinated. And also the Johnsons were from the South, which this is the time period where the Civil Rights Act was being discussed. So she traveled through the Deep South, to, through the Deep South on trains and she gave around 46 speeches. And in these 46 speeches, she discussed why the Civil Rights Act should be passed and why it should be supported. She discussed things with several things as being the Civil Rights Act with African Americans and popular Southerners, popular or influential Southerners. Well, the Washington Post accredited her, accredited her obviously giving the speeches as a heroine to the Civil Rights Act. All right, and then my third and final First Lady for this area 
area is Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton quickly became under fire as First Lady when she, her husband, Bill Clinton, the president at the time, appointed her to a health care board. Many said, what are her qualifications? Why is she here? So she, one, had her own education to stand on. Two, she was the First Lady. And three, she, again, could be that link between the president and the people through health care this time. So she set a precedent for future First Ladies to have a direct relationship with politics and the president. She was able to be on a health care board which spoke in front of Congress and testified to Congress about what was going on. And she was able to do that as First Lady, which is very important. Which leads me to the modern age. Now, Dr. Jill Biden was not originally a part of this research project, but I feel that she has already done something to add to this topic. So here's what I believe she's done. Dr. Jill Biden obviously has only been First Lady for a little while now, but also inheriting a quite strenuous political climate, she has already done very many things. Here's what I mean by that. Dr. Jill Biden, as you can see here, is in a um, graduation outfit. Why is she there? Because she's a professor. She's, she's a mom and a teacher at heart. Like many first ladies before her, being a wife, being a mom is definitely important to her. But she wanted to also create an entirely separate sphere from first ladies, from first lady from the White House, from the president. So because of this, she has decided to continue to teach at a community college, which, little known fact, I would have gone to if I would have stayed in Washington, D.C., which is really fun. But she alone is breaking so many things. For example, the gender norm for the like let's say 1950 traditional family is for the woman to take care of the kids, be a wife, right? That's what we all were conditioned to think as children. Well, Dr. Jill Biden says, nah, nah. I worked hard for this education. I worked hard for this PhD is what she's thinking. And because of that, she's like, I'm not gonna give that up for anything. And so, because of that, she, keeping her own job, she not only is jumping through several different hoops, whether that being, they, she even came under fire earlier as if it was the Constitution because the president is not supposed to receive certain funds. And she and her university has even had a special part of her salary portioned off so that she does not break that constitutional law. Which is very interesting how I think it is. But being First Lady, being and having a professor position and having that separate sphere adds a whole new tier to this. She can do and be something separate than what the office requires her to be. All right. So what does this mean? The Office of First Lady, or role of First Lady, began as a passive role, yet has evolved and advanced through first hostess, international spotlight, and support in domestic policy. While these women had specific roles in their husband's administration, their teamwork, through their teamwork, their own character, and their own drive, artifacts were able to be preserved, public opinion was able to improve drastically in their favor, and they provided the perfect breeding ground for political ideas to be discussed, not only would it be in their home, but also in the White House. So throughout their terms, I use that term loosely, because again, it wasn't stated in the Constitution, but first ladies have been the link between the president and the people. And this political link was established through that boldness of first ladies taking a stance on policies that directly affected the American people. First ladies going to marches, going to protests, being present with the people, coming down and being with them instead of being cooped up in the White House. 
very important. And First Ladies have become more personable due to their support and policy areas that were difficult to find, creating a way for the American public to identify with, identify with them, thus creating a bridge between themselves and voters, which is very important. All right, so what's next? What does all this mean? Why is it important? Here's the thing. We have, we don't know what's gonna happen because we might have a first gentleman. We don't know what's gonna happen in the next elections coming up. I hope within my lifetime we have a female president and a first gentleman, but we don't know. I hope, again, that first ladies will continue to break out of the quote unquote shell that has been provided for them and it will set new precedent and new things for first ladies to be able to do and to be able to be. Thank you. That's it. Questions? Who's a, a first lady who um, maybe interested you that you started to look at that you ended up maybe not including in your study? Abigail Adams. So why did she interest you and why did you decide not to interest her? She interested me because while well, she was not necessarily, uh, it actually wasn't your class, <laughs> one of the ones, um, remember the ladies, she said. And I thought that was super important because again, various first ladies like Eleanor Roosevelt would tell their husbands what they thought. Abigail Adams was no different. She definitely was there and was like, don't forget this. Why don't, have you thought about this? And because of that, I thought that was very interesting. A whole perspective of this project that people don't understand is first ladies who have created their own legacy, a part of their presidents, have challenged them and have disagreed with them publicly. Well, it's not a requirement, it's definitely bold. Um, because one, that's like, you're married to them, you're stuck with them forever. But also, that's on a national and international stage. So, sorry, I have a sharp pain going through my chest right now, and it hurts really bad. Yes? So, um, well, comment and then a question. Sure. Okay, so the photo that you have is two first ladies. Sure. So, you were talking about Lady Bird Johnson yeah. and civil rights, but I'm not mistaken. Yep. That's an ERA. Yes, very um, good. <laughs> yes. So, if I that's, and so that should probably be Betty Ford? Yes, very good. Okay. So um, I would have been able to talk more, but like I said, I have a sharp pain going through my chest right now, so I'm going fast. Uh, but yes, this is the Betty Ford and Lady Bird Johnson at an Equal Rights Amendment March. And a big thing with these two women, they publicly were like, I agree with this. Not only were they like Eleanor Roosevelt, who wrote columns about it, both of them were like, I stand for this. Come at me, bro. <laughs> In a modern sense, that's how I would say it, for sure. But good job. Yeah. I was uh, wondering, when I forgot to say it, I was like, no, what's going on? Yeah, and then, then my question, sure. so one thing, uh, like early on, so that is outside of my time period, but as yeah. an early member, so one thing that, that's always sort of in the background of creating the presidency uh, has to do, you know, how it is and isn't reminiscent of monarchy. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering in which ways, if there are ways that you think that first ladies have sometimes acted like royal consorts? <laughs> So, and sometimes I've had, like you mentioned, like Michelle Obama sort of being trying to be like kind of a mother for the whole country, and yes. that's like, I mean, Marie Antoinette tried to do the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I'm just curious if that came up at all, like the the contrast or any concerns about first ladies being like. Sure. Um, it did not come out as much as you would think. It did with the earlier ones, but obviously with the later ones, it did not as much. Um. I would say first ladies, like you said, are trying to be more either a social leader, the motherly figure, the wife, something like that as a figure. But absolutely, you could. that would be a really interesting thing to compare them 
Um, I never actually thought about that, even in my suggestions or research that didn't cross my mind, but that'd be really interesting to look at for sure. I know it's kind of an after question, but I thought I'd come. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. I've been working on this for a, about actually a year, almost to the day. So, yeah, the one I got assigned in research. So. This is, so here's the big thing about this topic, and I should have said this at the beginning, but people have done their doctoral thesis on this. This is one of the topics I might want to do for my doctorate. So like, it's hard to squish it into 12 pages. And Dr. Casey put a cap on me at 12 pages for the simple reason as just touch lightly on as many as you can, but also do the topic justice. And I think that was the biggest challenge for me as a student to do. And I, I tried to do all these women the best I could with presenting their information, but again, people have wrote entire books on this. Definitely more than 12 pages, definitely more than um, this presentation allows, for sure. Any other questions?